Good evening and welcome to the 24th Wabash College Moot Court Finals. Uh, this annual competition is co-sponsored by the Indianapolis Association of Wabash Men and the Wabash College Rhetoric Department. My name is Todd McDorman. I'm a professor in the Rhetoric Department and I help organize the competition. Uh, we had uh, just a fantastic competition this year. We had 40 Wabash students participate and if you think about that, that means it was uh, about four and a half percent of our student body uh, participated in our moot court competition. And in agreeing to participate in moot court, they uh, had the privilege of poring over a complicated legal problem, developing cogent arguments on that problem, uh, expressing their oral advocacy under intense questioning from faculty and in particular alumni attorneys. They did all of that without receiving any academic credit, and they even got up early on a Saturday morning. It might sound a little bit crazy, and perhaps it is, but that's one of the things that also makes it uh, very Wabash. Uh, if there's one thing we know that Wabash men thrive upon, it's competition, and they certainly get that through Wabash College Moot Court. Uh, from the 40 competitors in our original round, uh, 12 were selected to participate in the semifinals on Monday night. And before you, you have the four finalists. Uh, many people contribute to Moot Court, and we appreciate all of their contributions. Uh, students who participate, staff, faculty, alumni who contribute. Uh, there's an outstanding committee uh, that helps put this together, including Professor Himsel, Matt Griffith, John Pactor, Seamus Boyce, Jane Ann Himsel, who is the primary author of this year's problem. Uh, and just as well, we have a number of staff on campus, Mindy Mills, Tim Melville, uh, the Educational Technology Center, Alumni and Parent Relations, and many others, uh, a complete list of which you will find uh, in your excellent program that John Pactor puts together every year for us. So we have four finalists tonight, two representing the petitioners, two representing the respondents. Representing the petitioners, and that is the Baker Higgins and Avenue Q, are Jake Vermeulen and uh, Walker Hedgepath. Jake Vermeulen is a first-year student from Brownsburg, Indiana. He lives in Martindale Hall. His academic interests include economics and political science. Uh, so far, he's involved in Glee Club, and he looks forward to becoming more involved in campus as the year moves along, and he currently is thinking about law school after Wabash. Joining Jake uh, on the petitioners is Walker Hedgepath. Walker is a junior from Munster, Indiana. Walker lives in Martindale Hall, he is also on the Glee Club, and he is a history major, and he has minors in Asian studies, rhetoric, and education. Uh, Walker has several campus activities. He's the vice president of the International Students Association. Uh, he is a democracy fellow uh, for Wabash Democracy and Public Discourse, and he's the president of Lambda Pi Eta. Uh, that's the rhetoric honorary. After Wabash, Walker uh, plans to pursue a PhD in history. Uh, congratulations to Jake and Walker. On the respondents, and that's the side that's representing uh, Broadway Commons and Smith and Jones, uh, we have uh, Ein Pham and Jacob Reem. Ein Pham is a senior from Hanoi, Vietnam. He is a double major in mathematics and political science, and he has a minor in Asian studies. He's been involved with the Vietnamese Student Association and has a great love of language, uh, being skilled in English and in Chinese, where he's won uh, an award at a Midwestern language competition. After Wabash, uh, Ein plans to pursue uh, a graduate degree in political science. Joining Ein is Jacob Reem. Jacob is a senior. He's from Farmersburg, Indiana. He is a member of Delta Tau Delta. Uh, he is a member of Student Senate, the Pre-Law Society. Uh, he also writes for the Wabash Commentary. He studies political science and philosophy, and after Wabash, he plans to pursue uh, his law degree. Uh, congratulations uh, to Ein and Jacob. Uh, at this time, Professor Himsel will introduce tonight's panel. Thank you, Todd. It's my honor to introduce to you our distinguished panel of judges. Our Chief Justice this evening is the Honorable Margaret Robb, a judge of the Indiana Court of Appeals. 
Before she took the bench, Judge Robb had a general law practice for 20 years in Lafayette, Indiana. Indiana Governor Frank O'Bannon appointed her to the Indiana Court of Appeals, which she has served, where she has served with distinction for 19 years. She has previously judged this competition in 1999. Our next panelist is Judge Rudolph Pyle III, also a judge of the Indiana Court of Appeals. Before he took the bench, Judge Pyle served as an Indiana State Trooper, an adjunct professor at Anderson University, and both a deputy prosecutor and judge in Madison County, Indiana. Indiana Governor Mitch Daniels appointed him to the Indiana Court of Appeals, where he has served with distinction since August 2012. We always include a Wabash alumnus lawyer on our panel. Steve Creason fills that role tonight. Mr. Creason graduated from Wabash in 1997, and after graduating from Indiana University School of Law, he commenced a long career in public service in the Indiana Attorney General's Office, where he presently serves as Chief Counsel. He is known as an appellate expert and served our Attorney General as Chief Counsel of Appeals. And finally, we always have a Wabash faculty member on our panel. Given the nature of the curious and challenging topic, we've called out of the dugout the chairman of our religion department, Dr. Derek Nelson. Dr. Nelson is a theologian and a historian of Christianity who has published a great many books and articles. He is also an ordained Lutheran minister. Good evening. This is a matter in involving Henry Higgins and Avenue Q Bakery, Inc. versus Georgia Smith and Albin Jones and Broadway Civil Rights Commission. We're here for the oral argument. Gentlemen, I understand as petitioners you're reserving three minutes. You may be heard. May it please the court, your honors, my name is Jake Vermeulen, um, and I represent the petitioner in this case, Mr. Henry Higgins and Avenue Q Bakery Incorporated on the issue of free speech tonight. This case uh, centers around an interaction that lasted a mere 20 seconds. Mr. George Smith and Albin Jones walked into Mr. Higgins' bakery, uh, were looking at a book of custom-made cakes, and when Mr. Higgins approaches them, or approached them, they asked him to make a cake for their wedding. He said that he would not um, be able to create a wedding cake for them, um, but that he would be willing to serve them any other form of baked goods um, in the store. Was the, there any discussion of what the cake would look like, or what the nature of the cake was, or was the only discussion just they wanted a cake for the wedding? There was not. Um, however, Your Honor, uh, that does not preclude him from knowing that it would in convey a celebratory message. Um, well, you, don't, you don't know that if all you know is that it was a cake. Would that be correct? You don't know what was the intention to, whether there would be any wording on it, whether there would be flowers, nothing, rainbow colors. It was just a cake. Well, Your Honor, it was a wedding cake um, to be used as a central piece of the, uh, of the celebration of a But you don't know that, wedding. do you, from the record, if this conversation took place in 20 seconds? We do know that it was a wedding cake, um, which is traditionally the centerpiece of any wedding celebration. But you don't know what it was to be with this wedding? We do not know exactly what was to be on the cake, Your Honor. Thank you. You use the term merely 20 seconds. Are you suggesting that the time of the conversation has some relevance? No, Your Honor, um, the, it's just a fact of the case that it was a 20-second conversation. You used the word merely. What was the reason for using merely to describe 20 seconds? You said merely 20 seconds. Didn't you say merely? I believe I did, Your Honor. That's yes, like sir. a value judgment on the time. I'm, I'm simply asking if it was a minute or the conversation took two minutes, would that mean something in this analysis? No, Your Honor, it's, it's just a, that 20 okay. seconds is a relatively short period of time. Okay. We believe that the court should overturn the lower court's decision um, and grant Mr. Higgins an exception in this case to the Broadway anti-discrimination law, which, per, which uh, prohibits, among other things, 
discrimination on the base of sex, religion, and sexual orientation. We believe that the, or that the court should reverse this decision for three reasons. Number one, that Mr. Higgins' cakes qualify as pure speech and expression, um, meaning that the precedent of the fair case, um, the Rumsfeld versus the Forum uh, for Academic and Institutional Rights, uh, is incorrectly applied in the case, and that the case of Hurley versus Irish American LGBT of Boston is the more uh, relevant case to this matter. What do you mean whenever you say it is pure speech, that the baking of the cake is pure speech? We mean that the cakes that Mr. Higgins produces um, share many of the qualities of art, um, and ha as has been previously ruled by this court in Brown versus the Entertainment Merchants Association, um, art does not become less of art because of the medium used. Um, just because something is edible does not preclude it from being art. In this you case. don't know that. You don't know what art, maybe they only wanted a plain chocolate cake. You don't know what art would be on there, if any at all, particularly if you were willing to sell him other baked goods. Maybe what they really wanted was a brownie. I mean, so you don't know whether this cake was going to be an artistic example. Well, Your Honor, we do know that Mr. Higgins only creates um, custom-made wedding cakes um, and that he pours hours of time designing and then creating each cake um, into the process. Um, and the third reason we believe that this court should, uh, should reverse the lower court's decision is that strict scrutiny should be applied in this case um, and it is not met in our opinion. If, if the facts of the case were that <clears throat> the conversation was a little bit longer and the complainants were wanting just a simple cake with nothing on it because they wanted to make a statement that um, they didn't want excess celebration, you know, I mean they wanted a very simple, they just wanted straight up carrot cake. Um, and they didn't want, they just heard that he's, his cakes are particularly tasty. Um, and they didn't want any of his design qualities. Would that change the outcome of this case? If your, if your client then said no, I still won't do it. Well, Your Honor, in that case, um, it would still be for a, a wedding that is directly contrary to Mr. Higgins' religious beliefs um, and would be forced so is your argument then that the problem is that his cake will be used for the wedding or is it the problem that his cake will be making a statement about the wedding in support of it? Which is it? Well, Your Honor, the, sorry about that. Your Honor, the, uh, could you repeat that? I'm sorry, I distracted well, is, is, myself. Is the problem that he has is that there is a homosexual couple that wants to have one of his cakes at the wedding or is it that he would be sending a message in his cake well, Your Honor, it's both, um, to, to answer your question. Um, Mr. Higgins believes that to participate in the wedding in any way um, would be contrary to his religious beliefs. Um, and also he believes that his cakes, um, which are custom made, again, um, and express messages of celebration, regardless of what is on them, um, about the wedding, uh, it would be forcing him to, to say something that he does not believe. But if it... But if the issue is the, that, um, that his speech is unclear, why couldn't he make clear what his intentions are through some other means, like a sign in his window or a, a T-shirt that he wears when he delivers the cake that says, I oppose this marriage? I'm sorry, could you, could if the you problem rephrase is the, the unclear, question? If the problem is the unclarity of his intention, why can't he be asked to follow this law and yet make clear his intentions and his, uh, his religious beliefs? Well, Your Honor, in, in the case of Hurley versus um, Irish American LGBT of Boston, uh, the court ruled that he could not, or that um, the, uh, that you could not, or the state could not force someone um, to speak another person's message. Even if there were um, uh, disclaimers, it would still be forcing him to speak another person's message. You've opened the door to the public. Where do we draw the line? We're not going to sell to these these two people because they're gay, we're not gonna sell to someone who's black, we're not gonna sell to an interracial couple, I don't believe in interracial marriages. When the particular item, you, you, you indicated he was willing to sell them anything else, um, 
What if they didn't tell you that it was a wedding cake? They just came in and said, I want a cake. Could you then, in your own mind, know that it was for this purpose and refuse? Aren't you really asking the court to allow you to discriminate? No, Your Honor. Um, well, in that case, uh, if they had just asked for a cake, no, he would not have had uh, reasonable justification for turning them away. Um, and if, uh, so yeah, if I, I believe I've answered your question, is that, um, have I answered the, the Well, we're, again, where do we draw the line? Um, does does um, he have other people working with him in the bakery? He does, however, he is the, the only person who works on the wedding cakes. Your well, Honor. again, all they asked you for was a cake. You don't know whether this wedding cake is any different from any other cake you sell. So maybe someone else in your shop would be making this cake. The problem is you don't know. Isn't that correct? You don't know. All you know is the function of what they were doing, not the cake itself. And does, doesn't that matter? If you would sell them something else, it's not the artistic part. It's the product, and it's the people you don't want to sell to. Well, Your Honor, it's, it's the purpose that this cake would be used for, which is to celebrate a wedding that Mr. Higgins is fundamentally opposed to and but believes. Your, but your purpose that in not doing it is because it is artistic. It is his artistic work. And you don't know that if you don't know what the cake is going to be. Well, Your Honor, it would also be, in this case, an expression um, of a, a wedding cake is inherently an expression of celebration um, for the couple um, and the, the marriage. Um, and for Mr. Higgins to be forced to facilitate that message um, and to, to speak that message through his cake um, would be uh, a, a direct infringement upon his First Amendment rights. What if, I'm sorry, go ahead. What if nobody knew he made the cake? I'm sorry, could you... Uh, what if nobody knew that he made the cake? Well, Your Honor, he would still be forced to speak um, another person's message um, through the cake, and that would still be compelling him to speak, um, which would subject, subject it to strict scrutiny. Um, so so uh, the person has a First Amendment right, if I'm understanding your argument correctly, a person has a First Amendment right to not provide public accommodation whenever the recipient of the message is going to be using it for a purpose that they object to, as opposed to making him actually send the message. I'm sorry, could... Um, Clarif could you clarify the question? Sorry. Your problem, your, the problem that you seem to identify here is, is how the complainants um, are, are going to be using the cake, not what he does with the cake. Well, your His Honor, concern is about how somebody else is going to buy the cake and how they're going to use it, right? Well, Your Honor, in, in this case, the issue is with the, the message that... Um, he is being asked to facilitate and to, to foster, um, as, as the court ruled in, in Woolley versus Maynard, that um, an individual does have a right to hold a viewpoint different from the majority, and they do not have to foster the, uh, or foster the um, expression of that, uh, or of a, a, an opinion directly opposed to their own. So it's, so it's an incidental message? It is not an incidental message, Your Honor, because the wedding cake is um, is, or is uh, always a symbol of celebration of the wedding, I believe, if I'm understanding your question correctly, Your Honor. Does it matter that the Supreme, that, the, that there is no um, progeny of cases that would, would treat commercial speech in the same fashion as personal speech? He's not doing this as a person, he's doing it as a business, and commercial speech is not afforded the same First Amendment protection rights? Well, Your Honor, the, uh, the, um, the Avenue Q Bakery is a closely held corporation, and as the court ruled in Hobby Lobby, um, in the Hobby Lobby case, it, he does still retain those same rights. I see that my time has expired. May I, I conclude, Your Honor? Mm -hmm. um, well, we believe that this court should reverse the lower court's decision for the reasons already explained, um, and we thank you for your time this evening.
May it please the court. My name is Walker Hedgepath, and I'm second petitioner representing Avenue Q Bakery and Mr. Higgins. So today I'm going to be arguing on behalf of the free exercise of religion, two distinct claims. First, the treatment of other bakers in Broadway suggests that the Broadway Anti-Discrimination Act was not neutrally or generally applied. And secondly, that the Broadway Anti-Discrimination Act um, failed the, is an example of how scru strict scrutiny, it did not meet strict scrutiny on an as-applied basis. Does it matter that in the time that, that from the time this incident happened uh, until now, there has not, same-sex marriages were not found to be protected under equal protection. They weren't allowed in all 50 states and that in your state, the marriage would not be legal, although they, now it would be. Does that make any difference legally to our analysis? Uh, no, Your Honor, because in this particular case, what, what uh, our client is expressing is more so with regards to the application not necessarily with the intent, with the actual intent of the law. So well, I'm not it, talking about the intent either. I'm talking about whether it's legal or not. So could you reframe, rephrase your question? At the time these gentlemen asked for, you, for your client to make the cake, marriage, same-sex marriage was not legal in your state. It is now. Does that provide any implication of whether or not our analysis is different now than it might have been at the time of the refusal. Uh, no, Your Honor, because in this particular case, our client was not necessarily concerned about the legal matter of whether the same-sex union would be legal to begin with. It's solely with regards to the business transaction of making the cake. So with regards to what the, Broadway, what the state of Broadway has done in terms of treating bakers uh, similarly, similarly situated, to Avenue Q, uh, there were in, in the evidential record there are several other bakers who I, whom I will refer to as Lewis et al., who objected to making cakes that had particular messages. Some examples in the record included um, cakes that had um, a verse from Leviticus and saying that homosexuality. But you don't was know a sin. what the message was going to be. Perhaps it was just a plain chocolate cake with no message at all. So those cases are inapposite. No, Your Honor. The basic problem still the basic problem for our clients still exists in the act of actually just producing a cake to begin well, with. Well, the example you just gave was that they shouldn't have to have have to be forced to make a cake that had um, a particular religious statement on it. This cake would, maybe has no religious statement on it. Your Honor, yes, that it, that is it is true that the other cakes were about messages that were going to be directly written on our cake. But for our client. The problem is the act of just producing a cake period, even if it's a plain white but he cake. But offered, he offered to make any other cake they wanted. Uh, so it's not the making of the cake. Uh, well, with regard to, our client stated in the record that he does not create wedding cakes for same-sex couples. But that I understand did, that's yeah. what he said, but you just said you don't want the decoration, and I'm saying you don't have anything in the record that even suggests that there was going to be anything on them other than the cake that he offered to sell them. Yes, Your Honor, we, the conversation never progressed to that point, but to, uh, but to our client, the act of just being, the act of baking a cake, even if it's just a plain white cake, just the act of baking a cake for a same-sex couple uh, violates his religious beliefs. You and, mentioned the standard strict scrutiny. Yes. Could you share with us your understanding of strict scrutiny? Um, yes, Your Honor. Uh, so we're, what we're interpreting stic strict scrutiny is with regards to the state's so-called dignitary interest and whether or not there's a compelling interest. And, and so let's start there. Do you believe that Broadway, the state of Broadway, has a compelling interest in this law? Um, um, on the as-applied basis, I don't think so. Because in this particular case, absolutely, we are not saying that the... Uh, that Smith and Jones don't have a dignitary interest. We're saying that in the way in which the law was applied, uh, the state of Broadway uh, harmed our clients' dignitary interest. Uh, and what we're predicating this is from um, the, the case of Hurley um, v. Irish American um, LGBT from 1995, which uh, predicated on this idea that to shield just those co choices of contact that in someone's eyes are hurtful is not alone enough of a basis. All right, so the first part is 
It's got to be a compelling governmental interest. What's anything else about strict scrutiny? It yeah, if it, if it has to be narrowly tailored. Narrowly yes. tailored. Yes. Why isn't this law narrowly tailored? Or do you believe that it is? I think in this particular case, uh, the law is generally, yes, narrowly tailored, but the problem is as has it been applied. So uh, this stems back to... Is there a third part to this strict scrutiny? The, what we're relying on is the, the doctrine that uh, strict scrutiny uh, can be determined on an as-applied basis. So from, we're relying on the case of um, Gonzalez v. UDV, which states that uh, strict scrutiny applies not just to the broad interests, but also to particular parts. So what we're saying with, with strict scrutiny is that uh, in this particular case, the, the state uh, has voided the compelling interest. So your argument is, generally speaking, this law would be valid. If there is a compelling interest, yes. it's narrowly tailored, and the least restrictive means has been applied. But you're just saying, in your case, on these facts, it's wrong? Yes, on an as-applied basis. And that also ties into... Uh, what we were arguing on the, for the first major point with how the law has actually been applied to other bakers. So uh, the problem is, is in, the, in, this, in the justification for, refu and for recognizing other bakers' rights to refuse to bake cakes that have derogatory message, the, uh, the appellate court wrote in its opinion that uh, Mr. Higgins' cakes, his custom wedding cakes, they assume do not, one, communicate anything on his personal beliefs. Second, the expression is not the belief of Mr. Higgins, but rather the belief of his clients. And thirdly, that uh, in the case of disclaimers, nobody would attribute the fact that he's making a, a cake if he were to well, say Well, isn't that, that accurate? I mean, the cake is not your client's expression. It's his customers, right? The customers get the cake, and they do with it what they want. They take it to... They take it to a birthday party, a wedding, but then it becomes their message, their celebration of whatever event. It has nothing to do with your client, isn't that right? Uh, no, Your Honor, because to our clients, our clients' uh, deeply held religious beliefs, the act of putting forward all this time into making But to, who would, who would know cake. that? Somebody gets a cake, takes it to their event, puts it on the table, and they start cutting into it and eating it and having a good time. Who, who knows that this is supposed to mean, have a religious meaning? All they know is it's a cake, wedding cake, and it tastes good, right? So where's, where's the religious message? Help me understand that. Yes, the religious message is related to, for example, in the, uh, in the opinion referenced as the Charsley case, where the court noted that cakes are, quote, highly distinctive structures that function as markers for weddings. So to our client, the the act of investing significant time making these high quality custom baked cakes uh, that that to him that to him is recognizing the celebratory function that cakes have in weddings and that conflicts with uh, his view on same-sex marriage you keep using this phrase deeply held religious belief but religions aren't just about beliefs they're also about practices and habits and ways of life so why should we why should we believe you when you say your client has this religious belief because, uh, um, Your Honor, that's the, reason why, that's the reason why our client chose to pr pursue this to this level. Uh, our client would not simply just try to turn away potentially part of his customer base uh, on just any willy-nilly reason. He recognizes, our client recognizes <coughs> that this is something really, really important, hence why we're here today. And so, uh, based was, upon... I'd like to hear more of your explanation about how it's generally applicable, or how it's not. How it's not just mm -hmm. um, what what is your point there? Because um, I'm not sure that I understand the the law is pretty straightforward. It doesn't deal anything with bakeries. It doesn't deal anything with re religious messages. Um, it doesn't make any sort of exceptions for some messages and not others, uh, or some pra religious practices and not others. So whether we're talking about speech or we're talking about ex free exercise. Um, what, what is your point about how this doesn't satisfy that point? I see that my time has expired. Please. May I ask the question? Um, so uh, our point um, with regards to general applicability uh, was hinging on the treatment of other bakers. Uh, what we're saying is for the other, baker, the other bakers that objected to writing Leviticus and such on their cakes, 
the, um, the, the Broadway, the state of Broadway recognized that as being legitimate. And um, clearly that suggests then that um, the state of Broadway is recognizing some instances where cakes do have a message and they objected to making that message. To and our so point. therefore the state has to recognize that all cakes send a message. In the, in, it yeah. doesn't have to, it's not able to draw a distinction that some cakes might have send a message and some don't. And how does that have, relate to free exercise? I know that it's up, your time's up, but if you could briefly. Yeah. Uh, so it's not just all cakes. What we're talking about here in the case of the other bakeries here in town is they're about custom made wedding cakes. So these are not cakes, for example, that roll off an assembly line. These are cakes where the bakers put in a lot of hard work and dedication. And that, and the act of that, putting in all that dedication to a symbol that, uh, to a symbol that our client objects to, that is what violates his free exercise. And so for these reasons, we respectfully request this, record, this court to overturn the lower court's decision. Thank you. Your Honours, and may it please the court, my name is Ang Fan, and I, along with my co-counsel, represent the respondents in this appeal. We argue that the Commission's application of beta in this case does not violate the First Amendment Freedom of Speech Clause for three reasons. One, the application of beta in this case does not compel speech. Two, the application of beta in this case does not require Mr. Higgins to disseminate a third party's message. And three, selling a wedding cake is not an inherently expressive conduct. What do you think the standard of review should be? Your colleagues mentioned strict scrutiny. Do you agree with him that that's what we should apply, use that standard of review? Your Honor, we argue that this beta and the application of beta in this case survive strict scrutiny even when the conduct of selling a wedding cake is an inherently expressive conduct because the state in this case has a compelling interest to further. The Supreme Court of the United States made it very clear in the case of United States versus O'Brien in 1968 that the government may regulate an expressive conduct when it has a compelling interest. What's the compelling interest here in this case? The compelling interest in this case is to prohibit discrimination of a protected class and in Obergefell decided in 2015, the Supreme Court has made it clear that same-sex couples have a fundamental right to marry. Is there a competing compelling interest? Your colleagues argue that their client, Mr. Higgins, has a compelling interest in his religious beliefs or his artistic expression in producing these cakes. What happens when you have two competing interests? Your Honor, we believe that such argument from Mr. Higgins is just incidental burden imposed on him because the petitioner also pointed out that 62% of Americans currently favor same-sex marriage. Does it matter that, that a majority of people favor it in terms of the compelling interest of the, of, of the baker? Would it have made a difference if the conversation had lasted longer and the baker knew that uh, you wanted a <coughs> rainbow cake or you wanted some statement on there, three cheers, we can now marry, um, as opposed to the, the conversation that was held. Your Honors, that would make an entirely different case. The discussion between... But aren't we deciding broad law as opposed to waiting for that message? Your Honor, the message is important in this, in this case because in the case of FAIR, uh, Rumfels versus Forums for Academic and Institutional Right, the Supreme Court made it clear that not any conduct intended to convey a message can be labeled as speech and come under the guarantee of freedom of speech under the First Amendment. So if we... In that case though, universities weren't saying anything. Universities weren't even asked to convey any sort of message at all. It was merely providing <coughs> equal access. Your Honor, that is not necessarily the case of FAIR because when a university hosts an event of military recruiter on its campus, it makes some sort of expressive conduct of notifying the student 
spreading the, spreading, spreading the news to students. But that is just some element of expressive conduct in just, in just a conduct that cannot be labeled as speech, which is to pro providing equal access on campus. And this is the same in this case. An, a stipulated fact that the petitioner also argued that this wedding cake is a custom-made wedding cake. And a custom-made wedding cake cannot be custom-made if there, if there wouldn't be some elements and there wouldn't be the demand, the input of the customers. In some circumstances, customers even design the cake. And the baker is just the one who facilitates their design. Let's, let's say that it was a jeweler who was making the wedding rings. Yes, Your Honor. Um, and they make them from scratch, from the metals. For the, for the cast, you, I don't know how you make a ring. You do what you do to make a ring. Um, <laughs> in, in that process, there's a whole number of decisions that need to be made. There's things that they, the person is truly making something of their own, correct? For someone else. That's correct, Your Honor. I'm sorry? That's correct that in that case, and even in this case. Well, wh why isn't it that case for making a cake? Isn't it exactly the same? And wh why is it that a cake isn't something that is inherently personal to the baker? Your Honor, we argue that Mr. Higgins might have some personal connection to the cake and might, he indeed convey some message through the cake, but he immediately refused to serve these same-sex couple. So in that circumstances, the law, the beta, the application of beta in this case does not compel him to, to, uh, to desire cake in a certain way, to inscribe some certain messages on the cake, but somehow he... he no, it doesn't, it, I'll disagree with you there. It doesn't make it give any different message than he would to a heterosexual couple's wedding cake. Right, it doesn't make a different message. He doesn't have to make an extra special cake. I will agree with you there, but it does require the same message, does it not? I'm sorry. So it does require the same. You said that there was some he, that there is some connection that he has with his cake, and he is sending some sort of message whenever he makes a cake <coughs> and whenever he provides it to a client for their wedding. You you said that there is some amount there, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So therefore, it's. You're not asking him to make it some special message. You're asking him to send the same message that he would to other wedding cakes, right? I mean, I mean other, other weddings, correct? Correct, Your Honor. And why is it that the individual, rather than the state, can't make the decision as to what message is in support of something you want to send? Your Honor, because the state has a compelling interest to prohibit discrimination. And in that case, when he... The state, the state has a compelling interest in wedding cakes? In prohibit discrimination, because when he immediately refused to serve this same-sex couple, he used and imposes inherent belief on them, and he assumed their message doesn't that... The, doesn't the state impose this, the opposite message on him by compelling him? But he hasn't... He hasn't known the message before because the discussion happened in roughly just 20 seconds. So in 20 seconds, we argue that... Okay, there let's, let, then, then let's, assume, let, let's assume you're right there. But let's say it was a 20-minute conversation. Well, if it's 20 minutes conversation, we believe that he would already <coughs> know the message. And in that circumstances, we concede that when the message is offensive to the vendor, just like the case of the bakeries have the right to refuse to serve the, the cakes with derogatory messages against homosexuality, he could refuse to serve these, this gay couple. But that is not could just... Could he refuse to not make the cake with the message, or could he then refuse to make the cake? He could refuse to make the cake with the messages. But your position is that that's the limit of what would be allowable under the law. He would still have to make the cake, but absent the message. That's correct, Your Honor. But that is not... Because the, is it your position, I think you said, that making the cake was only an incidental burden? The message is, is an incidental burden put, imposed on Mr. The Higgins. message of making the cake. With messages. And so, that, 
So, so then if there's actual words on the cake, what type of, what, how do you make a message on a cake? It can be some sort of symbols, but it can okay. also be written inscription. Okay, so you, you actually have to um, put some sort of art, if you will, or some, some, you have to add something. You can't just have a plain cake. And um, that, what about icing the cake? Is icing the cake enough? It is not enough, Your Honor. How about adding the little flowers on the side? We don't really so you want to see them make that. <laughs> That's artistry. Well, I actually, um, the way you I'm, do that, you're you're telling something. You're expressing some amount of your soul, just like a Jackson Pollock painting, correct? You want Jackson Pollock paintings to me look like splatters of, of paint. You want if that sort of abstract message, we argue that the inherent exp expressive conduct must be interpreted by a reasonable person, because if we put a wedding cake as a centerpiece of the main isn't wedding... The, isn't the test about reasonable person standard, though, a reasonable person would have the message, not how a, a reasonable person would receive the message? It is a reasonable person could, re, could interpret the message. Because... So if, if a reasonable person would believe <coughs> that the wedding cake is some sort of symbol in support of a wedding. Yes, Your Honor. Then you fail. Yes, Your Honor. But when a wedding cake is put in the main situation, the main procedure of a same-sex wedding, then yes, it sends a celebratory message. It can be, but it's not inherently a celebratory message because they can buy it and serve as practical purposes at their wedding. So a reasonable person, I, we believe, would not go too far to interpret that as the... It's, it's, it's not the making of the cake that's the message, it's what the recipient chooses to do with it. So the burden, I think, are you trying to say that the burden isn't on the baker because he's just making the cake, the, the, the message is what, not what he does with it, but what you do with it. Is yes, Your Honor. But our, but our jurisprudence says that that's not the test. Our jurisprudence says it's the speaker's message, not the recipient's message. The couple is also speaking whenever they serve the cake, but so too would be the creator of the cake in, say, at some point in time, according to your argument. Why does the state get to decide in this context what messages it will allow or not? And the reason why I bring that up is because the purpose, one of the purposes of the free expression clause, the free speech clause, is precisely to stop the government from being the one who decides what messages are okay and what not. Because the dissent is more important in our democracy than the majority's view, or at least equally important. You so wanna, if, assuming that that's true, which you might disagree with me there, but then, then how is it, I've talked long enough. Your Honor, if it is entirely, if it entirely depends on the baker's message, the Baker decision that it is a, an, express, an inherently expressive conduct. Your Honor, I notice my time says, uh, may I fill in, finish my mm -hmm. answer? If it entirely depends on him, then the government could lose the ability to regulate business commercial sale because anything else can be deemed as inherently expressive conduct from t photography, wedding venue, maybe even wet waiters in uh, in weddings, and that slippery slope is supported in this case because of the precedence of the previous trials against same-sex couple weddings. A lot of other services provided did not want to did not want to serve uh, same-sex couples wedding and opposite-sex couple weddings alike. And for these reasons, we asked the court to affirm the decision of the court of appeal of the state of Broadway. Thank you. Your Honors, may it please the court. My name is Jacob Rehm, uh, representing the respondent in the religious liberty portion of this appeal. Uh, we disagree with the petitioners in this case in two general areas. Uh, first of all, we believe that the Anti-Discrimination Act here is, gen is neutral and generally applicable. And even if, it were, even if strict scrutiny were applied to this law, it would still pass and be able to be applied in this case. Let, let's, let's assume that the intermediate court got it right. 
one of the remedies that was applied was it required Mr. Higgins to submit quarterly reports on uh, what he would do and who he was serving, right? Yes, Is sir. there anything in the law that gives authority to the commission to require him to do that? The purpose of the commission, Your Honor, is to ensure uh, anti-discrimination uh, and any, any legal remedy to ensure that anti-discrimination occurs is uh, within, their, within their power. So the answer to my question is there isn't anything in the law that requires them or gives them authority to require the Higgins to submit quarterly reports. Um, really the only thing they have authority to do is say, hey, you're required to make the cake for gay couples and that's it. Well, Your Honor, they are, uh, they are allowed by the law to uh, complete any measures necessary to ensure that their orders are being complied with. Is that the least restrictive? Well, Your Honor, the, the law it is, the law here specifically outlaws discrimination on the basis of sex, uh, gender identity. Right, and, and I'm saying assume that. I'm talking about the remedy. Does the commission have the authority? Is there anything in the record that says that they can do that, fashion that type of remedy? Or do they just have the authority to say, make cakes. Uh, there's, no, there's nothing in the record to indicate that they don't have the authority, Your Honor. Uh, in cases like Employment Div Division versus Smith, uh, we understand from the Supreme Court's precedent that, that, that individuals in the United States have a right to believe anything that they uh, wish to in terms of religion. However, uh, when that right infringes on another citizen's uh, for amendment rights, uh, then it becomes a problem. And, and your rights are not unlimited when they butt up against the rights of someone else. And so here, what the discrimination statute is, is aiming to do is to prevent discrimination in public accommodation. Uh, and that is, that is purely what the statute says and, and what the commission was attempting to, to complete there. Um, here, the law is a neutral law of general applicability. Uh, there's no intent to discriminate against any particular religious practice. Um, unlike the case of Lakumi, uh, Church of Lukumi, there is no religious gerrymandering here. There are no secular practices which are similarly situated, which allow uh, bakeries or any other public accommodation to discriminate against uh, homosexuals or any other uh, minority. Can you explain the, the uh, gerrymandering point in that case some more? Uh, certainly, Your Honor. Um, so in the Lukumi case, there were certain secular and other kinds of religious <coughs> practices which were allowed by the statute, uh, and some religious practices, very specific ones, were outlawed. Uh, in that case, it was animal sacrifice. Uh, in this case, Your Honor, there is no particular religious practice which is outlawed over, or secular practice for that matter, which is outlawed over another. Uh, the only thing that the law does is outlaw discrimination. Um, There's also a line of cases, right, that you can't hide a purpose in neutral language and get past that test. Certainly, Your Honor, and, and this law does not try to hide its purpose behind neutral language. Uh, it is neutral, in addition to having neutral language. Is it, is it possible that, the, um, that a court can find that it doesn't meet this part of the test based upon the actions of the people who are enforcing it? Uh, and the way that the state chooses to enforce it? Yes, Your Honor. However, in this case, we have several, uh, several matters of precedent from the commission itself uh, where, where practices were allowed to be, uh, to be prevented by bakeries. We have the, the example of derogatory language being placed on cakes. Uh, the commission allowed bakeries to not place derogatory messages on cakes and to reject that business. Tell me what the derogatory messages were in that case. Uh, in that case, uh, one of the cakes was to be shaped like a Bible and uh, one of the verse in Leviticus um, saying something about homosexuality was mm -hmm. to be written on the icing. Uh, in this case, we have no evidence There's also of, a, a couple, right? Yes, uh, uh, one with, a, with a, yeah, an equal sign with an X through right. it. Uh, um, and so if I'm understanding the way then that the commission is enforcing this law, um, it's using it exclusively <coughs> to punish people who hold anti-majoritarian beliefs, right? It's saying that the people who want a message that criticizes homosexuals, homosexual marriages, um, we fully support people who don't want to further that speech. Um, and that's, that's a problem because that would be forced speech. So we don't, wanna, we don't wanna force anybody to do that. But when somebody wants to not speak a message in support of those, then the government also will step in 
and say that, no, you actually have to speak in at least some limited way. Your Honor, if, if the conversation between Mr. Smith and Jones and Mr. Higgins had lasted any amount of time longer than it did, if there had been any discussion of the message to be placed on the cake, this would be an extremely different case. I'm having a hard time understanding why that really matters because when you go to somebody, to, when, my, when I got married, um, I wasn't allowed to go to the baker to be part of the discussion on the wedding cake, so I don't know exactly how this sort of thing goes. But I'm pretty sure that my wife and my mother-in-law, when they did go, that they had very specific things that they wanted, that the reason why they went to get the cake was to get a wedding cake and to have that be spectacular and to have it you know, really be a centerpiece of the wedding and be something also that guests remembered about the wedding and that the guests enjoyed by eating it, which can definitely send messages by the way something tastes, right? Um, you don't, so I guess here you're forcing him to actually take part in a wedding. No, Your, right? your Honor. Because, because, because of the way that a cake is viewed in reality. Um, how does the time of that the conversation really matter to that? Can't he reasonably assume what his clients want? After all, he did tell them, if you just want a plain cake, I'll make that for you for some other purpose. Your Honor, what, what Mr. Higgins was saying was that he would, produce, he would sell them any product which he had not made for a specific purpose. Uh, what he was saying was that he refused to make a wedding cake for a gay couple. He had no idea what sort of message uh, the cake would have on it. He had no idea what the cake would look like. He knew it was more than for a gay couple, right? The record is clear. The parties agree. It was also for a wedding. Yes. It was going to be the wedding cake. Yes, Your Honor. Does it matter that, as I asked um, your colleagues, that at the time the law was such that the marriage was illegal? Uh, Your Honor, I don't believe so. Uh, the law here, the anti-discrimination statute, uh, was still in place. Uh, here, the single purpose of the law is to prevent discrimination in public accommodation. Mr. Higgins opened his business to the public and began selling goods to the public. Uh, what the law here is trying to do is ensure that Mr. Higgins is not discriminating against Does any Does it matter that it's a closely held corporation? It's not General Motors? It's not the... Uh... Your Honor, it, it does matter somewhat that, it, that this is a a closely held business. However, we, uh, we argue that even though it is a closely held business, uh, it doesn't burden his religious practice at all. Uh, even, if it, even if it were just Mr. Higgins making a cake, it still doesn't burden his religious practice. Would your argument be different if he were unwilling to make any kind of cake as opposed to just a wedding cake? Uh, no, Your In Honor. In terms of his artistic uh, expressions? No, Your Honor, uh, any class-based discrimination on the part of Mr. Higgins uh, would be um, treated in the same way by the commission. So to move on, uh, in, in cases like Newman versus Piggy Park, uh, we have persons attempting to discriminate against uh, others because of their religious beliefs. And the court has found time and time again uh, that your religious beliefs did not trump the freedom of expression and uh, freedom in public accommodation that other citizens have. Um, even if it's a religious, even if it's a religious message, uh, you can't uh, you can't overrule the constitutional rights of another person. Uh, this easily satisfies the anti-discrimination interest. Easily satisfies a legitimate state interest. And even if we were to apply strict scrutiny, the state still has a compelling interest in ensuring anti-discrimination. Um, in cases like uh, Bob colleagues concede that the statute is neutral, I think that's how you describe it, but they say as applied to Mr. Higgins, it's unconstitutional. How do you respond to their argument? Well, Your Honor, I disagree with their argument on the basis that if, if Mr. Higgins, as I've said before, had had a longer conversation, if there was any understanding of the message that the cake was to carry, the commission has found uh, in several, on several occasions that bakers are able to deny service to people uh, who, are, who are attempting to broadcast derogatory messages. Uh, that would have been forced So speech. his sincerely held belief, his expression that marriage is between one man and one woman, uh, doesn't matter. Your Honor, it does matter. Uh, it's a perfectly legitimate belief. However, uh, he cannot apply it to the couple in this case 
because he has no idea the message that they're trying to send with the cake. Uh, if, 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 like in other cases, there had been any sort of derogatory message, if there had been an anti-Christian message, that, if there had been a, I'm, even I'm a, having a hard time understanding what does it matter how somebody else, what a message somebody else will use with your statement? Uh, how, you, how does that matter to the ability of the government to regulate? Your Honor, it's, it's, it's it matters. Your, your message, right? What you would think you're communicating. Well, Your Honor, in that, in the cases that we cite, or, in, from you, the, or on free exercise here. So sure. it's also you're taking part in the ceremony. Exactly. If, like in the cases that we cite from the commission, uh, if there were any kind of speech, it would be, would be different. The cases like, in those cases, there was a specific message carried by the cake, uh, which was religious. Uh, in this case, there were no messages carried by the cake. In those uh, cases, were they allowed not to make the cake at all or just not forced to make the cake with that message? If, if, the, if, the, if, if the person in those cases had returned to the baker and asked for a cake without a message on it that was derogatory, the bakers would then have had to make those cakes. Um, if, the, if the person in those cases, if any person in any case, had walked into a bakery and asked for a plain cake uh, carrying no uh, explicit message, religious or otherwise, then there would be no grounds for... Um, if, if the... Clintons here um, went to a painter and wanted to, paint, commit, wanted to commission a painter to create a unique piece to be uh, part of the wedding ceremony itself. Going to, wherever they were holding their ceremony, it was going to be the backdrop for the um, behind the altar or, or whatever they chose to use there. Um, and he said, no, I, don't, I, would, I won't do that because I don't believe in homosexual marriage. Uh, would, I see my time has concluded, so I'll briefly Would that answer. be a problem? Uh, it depends on the content of the piece, Your Honor. It, so it's, let's say it's just pictures, just uh, abstract art. Uh, then it seems to me a very tenuous connection to make between that and religious practice, and it would very likely be decided in the same way that What's this What's the compelling was. government interest in that, in regulating that? Anti-discrimination, Your Honor. The compelling interest here is anti-discrimination. Uh, and with that, I'd like to respectfully request that this court uphold the lower court's decision. Thank you for your time. Um, your Honors, in closing, um, aesthetic and moral judgments about art are for the individual to make, not for the government to, to decree, even with the mandate or approval of a majority. This is from United States v. Playboy Entertainment Group. And I think that this is perfectly relevant to our case here because the respondents noted that cakes do have at least, quote, some amount of message reflecting the baker. And um, our client's view is that asking the it's baker... It's incidental. Your message is really just incidental um, to it, though. Nobody's going to know who the baker is. Nobody's really going to probably even pay attention to any particular other than just it's a nice cake. Um, Maybe they won't even have a whole lot of attention drawn to it. You don't, your client doesn't know any of these contexts. It's just straight up, he doesn't want to do anything for that because of his, what the state has determined discriminatory beliefs. Right, I mean. Well, y yes, Your Honor, it is true that he's not, he does refuses to make a, uh, a cake for a same-sex couple for a same-sex wedding. But on the other hand, uh, it, it's uh, incorrect to state that uh, nobody would know about it because that's precisely why our, our, we have a business, why um, our client has a successful business, Avenue Q but Baker. But you were willing to make other cakes and a neutral law, which we found, that has general applicability, we've consistently held does not run afoul of the First Amendment if it only imposes an incidental burden on the religious freedom. And in this case, you don't, it is just a cake. The use of it is the recipients. It is an incidental burden on you to make a cake. And we have held consistently that that doesn't run afoul of, of religious freedom. So tell me why we should change the course of, of what our law has been. Uh, because, Your Honor, to our client, it's not just an incidental burden. The act of making a cake is our client's it's But our he client's was willing vocation. to make a cake. He was willing to make a cake. Any other cake. So yeah. it, 
Tell me what the additional burden on him is if he was willing to make any other cake. Yes, Your Honor. It is true that the record, the record does state that um, um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Higgins offered uh, to make, happy to make and sell them any other baked goods. The problem is, is that this is with regards to a wedding cake. I understand the, that, the but the cake. burden on him is yes. the making of the cake. The wedding cake. And he was willing to do that, so it's an incidental burden. And we have consistently held that, that when you have a law of general applicability, neutrally applied, and if the burden is only incidental, it is not a violation of religious freedom. I'm saying, why should we change our course of, of, of legal theory at this point? Um, Your Honor, um, we're not asking for changing the entire course of the legal jurisprudence. Um, I see that my time has Make expired. Finish. Okay. Um, what we're saying is, is that our, um, our client, for our client, the burden is making the wedding cakes. The wedding cakes is, um, are the seminal of our business, the, our client's business, and what um, Mr. Higgins refused to do was to create wedding cakes. The act of which producing them is so intensive it violates his religious beliefs. For these reasons, we respectfully request this court to reverse the lower court's decision. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Take nothing from the questions that we asked. We do it to encourage the conversation. We will go back and deliberate. All rise. Well, I have to say it was wonderful advocacy, and I wish, and I know that I can speak for Judge Pyle, we wish we had this kind of advocacy every day in front of us. You have a lot to be proud of. It was an extraordinarily difficult case, and um, you can tell the kind of work that you put into it. I will say that we went back and um, had a good discussion. Uh, the vote was not unanimous, but uh, I would like to congratulate Tyne Pham. And now for a few comments. Mr. Creason? Judge Creason? <clears throat> Would you like me to start with Judge Pyle? Yeah, right. I'll start with Judge start Pyle. With he does this all the time. Uh, again, um, this issue would give attorneys and judges uh, fits and uh, you guys did a good job with it. Uh, overall, I think everyone showed good composure when you walked up there. Your manner of presentation actually matters uh, to courts and makes a difference for your clients. And so each of you got up there, you had good volume, made good eye contact with us, and that was great. Um, the only, uh, oh, also, uh, you demonstrated good knowledge of the law, uh, which was a surprise to me because we have attorneys who don't demonstrate good <laughs> knowledge of the law, but you knew you were mentioning cases in your argument, and I was like, 
hey, mm-hmm. these guys aren't even in law school, and they, they're mentioning cases. And I thought that was great. That was really good. Um, my critique probably would be when you're making argument, arguments, it's OK to concede a point. It's not a measure of weakness. Uh, all of us as judges will throw out questions and hypotheticals, and it's okay to say, yes, Your Honor, on that point you would be right, but then you can go back to your argument. That's what's called conceding an argument, and that's always good to do. It's okay to do that. Uh, that's all I have. Judge Creason? Um, this is never easy. It is, it is, when it's easy and you feel, talk a little bit about beforehand, um, be worried when you aren't nervous and when you aren't mm-hmm. terrified. That's when it's going to hit you like a storm you never imagined. Um, and I think you guys handled the nerves and the, um, the energy that you felt very well. Um, and no one really seemed to be um, shaken by occasionally aggressive questioning, whether it was. Um, sometimes, however, I think probably everybody missed some softball questions or some questions that were asked in a way that it was entirely possible for you to turn it right around and make a point. Um, and and that, those are difficult and those are often hidden and you, you always miss them, but um, sometimes you caught them and sometimes you didn't, but definitely remember to listen to a question, don't assume that a judge is asking something for any particular purpose or what the next question will be. I felt like sometimes it, it's difficult for me to do. It's something I constantly work on despite having done, I don't know how many of them. And, um, but they, uh, you, you need to just listen and be in the moment, know your case well enough, but then not be afraid to uh, to realize that maybe they're not going to take you down the path that you're thinking of. And you're, so sometimes there were answers that were given that were assuming where we were going. And at least in, in one circumstance, probably um, led to maybe a concession a little too early. Maybe. I don't know. Um, I don't know how I would have done it. So just some general thoughts there about um, how to handle those, those questions. Well, I want to congratulate all of you and, and say how impressed I was at how much is obviously in those heads of yours, uh, not just about this case, but in general. Uh, but the flip side of that is it seems as though you often got to your best point very late or uh, in, in a couple of cases just very much right at the end. And I wonder if, if, if prioritizing what's my really good... Um, What's my good angle that even my opponent is going to agree, yeah, you know, that's kind of true. Uh, and leading with that and making sure as we uh, grill you and interrupt you um, to, to have the prioritization of what, what the good stuff is to make sure that you uh, serve the good cake first, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> On that point, you don't have to go down the order of the tests. You never have to go down the order of the tests. And you can concede everything and go straight to the one, or you don't even say, yeah, I'm not conceding anything there. I want to get to my good point. Um, knowing that, that is very important. That's very good. You know, sometimes a, a judge will ask a question not because they really don't know the answer, but maybe in the discussions before when we're in chambers, we think you will be able to make a more compelling answer than I've been able to convince my colleagues, so I want to, you to answer the question. So sometimes I think I know what you're going to say, and I think you can convince people that I can't. Um, I think it's very hard to concede points. Um, even some very, very, very um, distinguished people um, have trouble. Uh, but we sometimes ask hypotheticals that are different so that you can say, you know, if that were my case, you're right. But it's not my case, and here's why. Um, and I don't know that I ever did a good job of it when I was arguing. You just don't hear the softballs. Um, and that's really hard, because sometimes you are, we are asking you questions that you can turn around. Um, but as I said, it's always um, do as I say, not as I did. I, I don't know that I really ever, I mean, I was always so much 
more articulate on my way home in the car from the oral <laughs> argument. <laughs> or maybe in the shower after I was thinking about the oral argument. Um, but even seasoned attorneys often have a very difficult time, and I think you all should be very, very, very proud of the job that you did. Um, you really just, it was quite an excellent performance from all of you. You knew your cases, you knew your case, um, and just be very proud. You did a really good job. The, this question was impossible. It was written by someone really cruel. <laughs> Come on up here. <laughs> Thanks for that, Steve. Just, uh, <laughs> I had to get that out. <laughs> uh, th we, we very much appreciate the service of our panel. They have never all served together at one place at one time. And that's what always makes it interesting and extra special when the panel works so well together and with our finalists. Uh, like our finalists, they don't get any credit for this either, except <laughs> for our grateful thanks of helping educate our students. Would you join me in thanking them? We live in difficult times, and every word we hear about our government at all levels is not a compliment. I'm trying to be understated. Um, but what you see here is, is public service, and, and we, we really should appreciate it at the highest level. As another token of our appreciation, each of our judges is receiving a gavel uh, that we have engraved uh, for this occasion as a keepsake, just as a reminder. Um, and uh, we're, we're very, very happy to bestow that upon them. We hope that they'll all consider coming back again. Um, Mr. Creason is a regular on this, uh, in this program as an alum, but uh, we, would, we would enjoy seeing them again as well. I, I add my uh, congratulations to our finalists. This really was one of the best rounds I've ever seen. Um, I, I, I just think we should thank them again for an outstanding <laughs>